sustainable farming. How robotics and digital data will change the future of agriculture. Sala Sukarie, University of Sydney. On the 9th of November 1989, I was studying for my university entry examinations. I remember clearly the politics that led up to the wall coming down, as well as the live footage. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Falling Walls Foundation, thank you for the invitation. They were great robots. They're not my robots, though. They looked really, really good. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is robotics and digital data and how that's going to impact food production over the next decade. It's an important aspect because more and more of our food will be produced, taken care of by robots from planting all the way through to harvesting. And that's something for some people they don't really care about because they don't really know where their food comes from anyway. For other people, it can be quite daunting. And it really depends on what your connection is to the land. And this becomes an important element. But in order to understand why robotics is going to have such a huge play in the agriculture field, we need to understand it from the grower's perspective. What is it that drives the growers, the farmers, to need this type of technology? I've listed a number of key points that I've, when interacting with growers, have seen the same story over and over again. One of the most fundamental stories is the ageing farmer. Anywhere you go around the world now, the average age of the farmer is above 50, 60 years old. And that's a problem for any nation that's worried about food security and nutrition security. The children that they send off to the city to get educated don't want to come back to the farm. It's very hard to find people who want to go work on the farm, so labour availability is very low. And also, if you could find labour, the cost is usually very high. The cost is high when you consider the supply chain and how much we want to pay for the food. So there's this human factor element towards farming and sustainability of farming in the future. There's also climate change and the impact it has on pests and diseases being able to spread more readily. A lot of these pests and diseases are now becoming chemically resistant. And when you look at regulations for chemicals, it takes a very long time from the experimentation at the universities all the way through to adoption on the farm. And all these things come together. One of the most important aspects is customer perfection. You and I want the most perfect fruit. It's got to be the right colour, the right size, the right shape, the right crispiness. And that has an impact on the farmer because the farmer has to grow that fruit, for example, to meet your perfection, but has to deal with all these constraints and that becomes very problematic. And like I said before, this is not just a phenomenon in Australia, this is a worldwide phenomenon. This is not new though, <clears throat> this is a postcard from 1900. The people of France were asked, what does the year 2000 look like? The people of Paris actually, so the Parisians had all these ideas and this is one of them. And as you can see, it's a nice gentleman sitting down, not sweating at all, controlling a whole farm with a lever and a few buttons. This process of technology evolution has been there from the beginning. And this is where we are at the moment now, probably a decade or slightly more now of digital technology being used on the farm. It first started with sensors and being able to put sensors on a farm and measuring information about what's going on on the farm, turning that into data analytics, using data analytics to be able to process that information and give you knowledge. Over the last five years, there's been more and more software that's available to the farmers to be able to make decisions. But the real game changer has been over the last two or three years, with computing power getting better, memory power getting better and cheaper, we're starting to get all of this in real time. A farmer now with their phone can understand what's going on on their farm in real time and what decisions they need to make in real time. And so it's an easy extension then for robotics to kick in. Because if you can sense in real time, and if you can make decisions in real time, then you can act in real time. And so now what we're starting to see more and more is there's robotic systems on the farm doing automated on-farm tasks. And eventually you're going to get to this stage where you've got like the postcard in the previous slide, we're going to get automated farms or semi-automated farms happening. So to make this more concrete, I'm just going to give you some examples of work that we've done in different industries so that you can kind of see what's happening. One of the first industries that we worked in was the tree crop industry. So apples, oranges, mangoes, bananas, nuts. And what they asked us to do was to build a system that they could turn away from making decisions on a paddock scale down to an individual tree scale. They were interested in knowing what each individual tree, how it was performing, and what they need to do for that individual tree, which they could never do before. 
So we built a robotic system, lots of different sensors on board, and that robotic system can autonomously go up and down the rows and collect information, all this different type of information from the trees as it's going up and down the rows. It will have information such as what you see up now. Now, to you and I, we see the same tree, different colours. Each one of those colours is representing a different spectral response. We're using hyperspectral cameras, multispectral cameras, infrared, thermal, laser data. To us, we only see the visual space, but to the robot now, we can see all these different spectra. But you and I see a tree, and that's because since we were young, we were trained, this is a tree, this is a tree, this is a tree. To a robot, it just sees a collection of ones and zeros. So we have to take these ones and zeros and pass it through machine learning algorithms, deep learning algorithms, to train the robot up to understand this is a leaf, this is a fruit, this is a twig, this is a flower, and so forth. And so what you get now is this, as an example, this is an autonomous robot going down the rows. This is an almond plantation. It's got its laser unit. The first set of algorithms are able to segment out a tree, a tree, a tree, a tree. So the robot understands what a tree is, given the laser data. Now with that laser data, it then says, okay, what's the visual data? It pulls out its visual representation. It says, okay, I see the tree, I see the tree, I see the tree. And then it goes to its next level of algorithms where it says, what do I see on the tree? So for here, example, it's counting all the flowers and localizing all the flowers. And over here, it can detect every single almond and count all the almonds. And it's doing this in real time. And it's overlaying that information onto a map so the farmer can understand, for example, this map here is looking at the distribution of flowers across the paddock for each individual plant a farmer can click on any one of those plants and see what the latest information is about that crop. We've done that to a whole wide range of applications. So on the left there is a mango farm where we could go up and down and count each individual mango, 77,438, I believe it was, for that particular paddock. We can also do it for apples, that you can see on the far right, and we've tried it with a lot of other tree crops as well. So that's what we've been doing in the tree crop space. In the row crops, especially in the vegetable industry, they asked us to build a robot from scratch and to rethink what it might look like to have a platform on a farm. This, is a, this robot that you see here, one of the important aspects that I want you to look at is you can see what the soil looks like. Right? It's all wet. There's, a, there's just been a rain come through. You can't pass a tractor over that because a tractor's too heavy. One of the key benefits of robotics is being able to reduce the weight of the system, 100 to 200 kilos, which means less soil compaction. It's solar electric. We can run this robot for 24 hours, seven days a week. Maybe not in Berlin weather, but at least in Australia and in Sydney weather, we can get that down to 24 hours, seven days a week. So think about what that means. A robot constantly out there in the field measuring information precisely. There's a collection of sensors underneath. Each wheel has its own electric drive, so there's no engine, there's no transmission, there's no drive shaft. So we go from a tractor that has 300,000 moving parts to a robot that has 300 moving parts. So less maintenance costs, less input costs, less fuel costs, and the list goes on. So what the robot does is as it's going up and down the rows, it's got sensors underneath, and those sensors are able to detect and understand what's going on with the soil and with this plant. Here we're using it, this is on a lettuce farm. We've got deep learning algorithms that not only can detect where the lettuce is, but also the age of the lettuce. So we can see slight differentiations between two different lettuces right next to each other. We can add a bit more fertilizer. This is doing biomass estimation to give the farmer an estimate of what's happening with the yield, for example, on their farm. You can see a little mechanical tine at the back there. If you can distinguish, if you can understand where the plant is, then you can understand what's not a plant. So here it's looking at each individual weed and it's removing the weed. So no herbicide use whatsoever is really what we're aiming for. That, Another application is being able to spray each individual crop. So I could see an insect on one crop and spray that, but not the next one, not the next plant, not the next plant, and so forth. So I'm completely removing all the input costs, the herbicide and the chemical use. And finally, here we're doing soil sampling. So we're just putting a little soil moisture probe into the soil and measuring what the water moisture looks like. So imagine 24 hours, seven days a week, measuring each individual crop, being able to sample, being able to spray individual crops, weed individual crops, take water moisture and pass this information on and actually do that information in real time. And that's where we're going now. Over the next year, you'll start to see these systems onto farms in Australia. The next example I want to give you is grazing livestock. Uh, this is a much harder problem because we're dealing with animals now. 
But what, uh, what farmers are interested in is can robotic systems be out there on the farm monitoring the health and the welfare of the animals, that's being the critical element. So this is our robot on a dairy farm, we're having a bit of fun here, we're trying to see if we can push the, the cows along. But what's important from a farmer's perspective is can they measure what's happening with each individual cow? Is it walking okay? Can I measure the temperature? Is it sick? Where is it eating the pasture? Is the pasture quality good? All this information is important. With pasture quality, you get a healthier animal. Healthier animal, in this case here, you get, healthy, you get better milk. When dealing with beef, it's a lot harder, right? So we've got undulating terrain here. It's a very different type of robotic system. Now you've got 400 kilogram animals, kil kil kilogram animals that you don't want to uh, interact with too closely, but you want to be able to measure, again, the same properties. Where are they? Are they healthy? Where are they moving along the way? And that becomes an important element as well. Everything I've shown you so far is about technology for now. So we've been able to help the farmers, and for example, with the grazing livestock, we probably still have five years, ten years before we can actually see something on the farm. While with the row crops and some of the tree crops, we're going to see the technology out there in the next two, three years. But the other aspect that we need to deal with is where is the next generation of growers coming from? Where, where are the next generation of farmers? And that's an important element. And what we're finding is the technology, as it's getting cheaper and cheaper, there's a technology cost that's coming down, we can start to use this technology not only to help train kids, in, in children in country areas, but also for developing countries as well. And this becomes the next element of the activity that we're looking at. This is a very simple robot. It's a two-wheeled robot. All the smarts, all the electronics, all the motors are inside the wheels, so it's a very modular system. You can change the configuration very easily. It takes 15 minutes to put the robot together. It's easy to pack up and put into the back of a car, so for, even though it's really low cost, it may still not be affordable by some schools and may not be affordable by some developing countries. So the ability to be able to have a central person, a consultant, for example, going from place to place. But it's the same concepts as before. If you can take the system, put the sensors on board, make it really low cost, think about 3D printing and where that's going to change the world in the not too distant future, being able to manufacture these things uh, at a very low cost. This is an example of working with the schools, being able to teach them about robotics and being able to teach them about coding. And this has taken on a lot of interest in Australia. Going out to country schools and teaching them about robotics is helping them understand actually there's a future to stay where you are. Coming into the city is not necessary. Getting out that digital, breaking that digital divide and taking the systems out to the farm, uh, out to the, the children out in the country areas is very important. And the other thing to test our hypothesis is we decided we'd take it to a, a, you know, to a poorer nation to understand what will happen there. We went to Indonesia, went to a place called Bandung, which, is a, um, which has a large agriculture area, and we did the same thing. We took the robot out there, we put it together, we showed the growers what it was about, and you'd be surprised that the constraints and the challenges they face are the same challenges you'd face anywhere else. Okay? But the same, using a smartphone to be able to detect each individual crop, because you can buy a smartphone anywhere. We've been able to detect things like diseases and pests. They lose about 50% of their crops because of disease. So being able to give them that is very, very important. But we also need to look at the surrounding ecosystem. Do they have the electronics and the manufacturing capability to be able to um, deal with robotics? And I guess one of the most important take-home messages we had was no matter where we went, children love robotics. If you can actually give them a robot and actually teach them how to use it, it becomes so interesting for them, so fascinating for them. If you can connect it back to the land, then you're trying to tie that back into that sustainable human factor when it comes to farming. So I leave you with the, the final aspect of it all, which is how does all this come together from a robotics perspective when you start to think about what does 2050 look like in feeding 9 billion people? Sustainable operations is one of the most important aspects, 24-7 precision agriculture, minimising input costs, minimising chemicals and energy, for example, become fundamentally important. If you can lower the cost of the technology, being able to go out to those country schools, rural schools, being able to teach them about robotics gets that next generation of growers coming in. And finally, if you get that technology low cost and also open up the architecture, break down that digital wall between countries, and that becomes a very fundamental aspect as well. Then you can actually start to bring these things together. Now, I'm not saying that robotics is going to solve this problem. Okay, this is a very hard problem. This is just from a technology perspective and a robotics technology perspective. There are other socio-economic political things that we need to look at. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Just imagine in five years' time, Falling Walls Conference outside, all the food that you eat, not a single human has touched it. And how do you feel about that? 
Thank you.